The year is 1928. Alexander Fleming, a physician and microbiologist, has just returned from his holiday to find that one of his culture plates of Staphylococcus bacteria was left uncovered. A fungus has now contaminated this culture plate and has created bacteria-free zones around all of the new fungal growths. This fungus, Penicillium notatum, would go on to create penicillin, the world's first antibiotic. It was an incredible discovery made completely by accident. Just 10 years prior, around 50 million people worldwide died during the 1918 flu pandemic. Although influenza A is a virus, studies have found that the majority of these deaths likely resulted directly from secondary bacterial pneumonia. One study that analyzed this using post-mortem samples from those who died during the pandemic ended the study by suggesting it to be a very high priority to stockpile antibiotics and bacterial vaccines for pandemic planning because of this. After all, antibiotics including Fleming's penicillin are still the first line of treatment against bacterial pneumonia in the modern age. Antibiotics fight against bacterial infections in a few different ways. They can slow bacterial growth, they can cause protein disruption within the cells, or they can disrupt bacterial cell walls in a way that results in apoptosis, which is the activation of programmed cell death. These are all incredibly beneficial for someone who has a bacterial infection, and the discovery and application of antibiotics had undoubtedly saved countless lives over time, and certainly would have saved many more lives throughout human history if they were around earlier on. But could introducing them earlier on in the timeline of humanity also have sped up the antibiotic apocalypse? This here is the cell lining of your GI tract. In a healthy gut lining, there are tight junctions present between cells that form barriers to prevent unwanted molecules from getting through. When tight junctions are present and functioning how they're meant to, these unwanted molecules, such as food particles, can't just seep through the gut lining and will instead have to wait until they're broken down enough for the cells of the small intestine to absorb the nutrients the way they're meant to. However, studies have shown that antibiotics can influence GI permeability. It can do this by changing the composition of the microbes within the gut to one that is linked with higher intestinal permeability or even by causing direct damage without changing the microbial composition much. Treatment with antibiotics, especially broad-spectrum antibiotics, impairs the intestinal tight barrier junction. Obviously, this is an important job, as you don't want undigested food particles, antibodies, toxins, or microbes to get a free pass through the gut lining. Having increased intestinal permeability increases a person's risk for many chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disease, metabolic dysfunction, behavioral disorders, cancer, and also could accelerate aging. In 2010, the United States prescribed 258 million courses of antibiotics. The age group with the highest prescription rate was in children under the age of 2, with a rate of 1,365 courses per 1,000 babies. The U.S. as a whole has a rate of 833 per 1,000 people, which is over double the rate in Sweden of 388 out of 1,000 people. The average child in the U.S. will receive three courses of antibiotics before they reach two years old. In fact, all American babies receive antibiotic drops directly after birth in hopes of preventing a rare eye infection. Higher prescription rates wouldn't be a problem if there weren't any unintended consequences or side effects, but as Dr. Blazier discusses in his book Missing Microbes, this is far from reality. The widespread use of antibiotics may be fueling the obesity epidemic, autoimmune diseases, food sensitivity and allergy conditions, autism spectrum disorder, certain cancers, and resulting in the creation of antibiotic-resistant bacteria also known as superbugs. Different antibiotics will have different effects on the microbes in the gut. There are estimated to be around 38 to 100 trillion microbes present within the gut microbiome, depending on who you ask. Most of these are either not harmful or maybe even beneficial for you. 
Antibiotics, regardless of how specialized they are at attacking only the harmful pathogens, will still have some spillover effect and impact your normal gut flora. This is especially the case when it comes to broad-spectrum antibiotics, which indiscriminately target both the pathogenic and the naturally occurring bacteria. A good analogy for this is like someone burning down their entire house just because they saw a bug. Even if you got the bug, you still destroyed everything else in the process. When microbes are wiped out due to antibiotics, they leave open space for new microbes to grow and fill in. Even if the pathogenic microbe was wiped out, previously naturally occurring and non-harmful microbes can now become opportunistic, in which they overgrow and can cause negative effects. This period after receiving antibiotics also increases the odds that new pathogens will successfully cause an infection. Dr. Blazier describes a study in his book about mice who were given salmonella bacteria and tracked how many organisms it took to infect them. Mice who had a normal gut flora required around 100,000 organisms to infect about half the sample. However, in the group that was given a single dose of streptomycin, which is a commonly used antibiotic, the mice then only required about three organisms to infect them. This is a 30,000-fold difference between the two groups after only a single dose of antibiotics. Because there is such a drastic difference between the two groups in terms of successfully getting infected, what happens if someone already had bacteria present within their gut that originally wasn't causing any issues because there wasn't enough of them, but now have the opportunity to overgrow once more real estate opens up after a course of antibiotics? And you'll also have to consider, what if this microbe is already resistant to antibiotics? Or, possibly within that sensitive window, once a course of antibiotics runs through, where one is more prone to getting infected, they're exposed to a new, different bacteria that is resistant to antibiotics. Dr. Blazier argues that this is coming, and he calls it the antibiotic winter, in which we have antibiotic-resistant bacteria, as well as the increased susceptibility of millions, and that this will inevitably grow to be a worldwide peril that cannot be stopped. Antibiotic resistance is exactly like it sounds. Some microbes will adapt over time to be more resistant to antibiotics, making the treatment either less effective or possibly won't even work at all. One of the ways in which resistance can spread is when microbes that already have acquired resistance will pass it down to their next generation, sort of like a grandfather passing on his genes down to his son, who will again pass it on to his children. This process speeds up when antibiotics are present in the environment, as the microbes with the resistance can keep dividing and multiplying to fill in the new open space while the microbes that don't have resistance will either die off or their growth will be inhibited or slowed. This effect can compound with multiple runs of antibiotics. Let's examine this effect with a case study. Jane Doe is a 61-year-old female patient who was admitted to the hospital. Jane presents to the hospital with a fever, shortness of breath, chest pain, and has a productive cough. Jane is then sent to radiology for a chest x-ray, where the report describes lobar pulmonary opacities, which, along with her symptoms, suggest the diagnosis of lobar pneumonia. Jane is then started on the antibiotic amoxicillin, while the lab results come back positive for streptococcus pneumoniae, which is the most common cause for community-acquired pneumonia. So, let's say that Jane originally had 1 million pneumococcal bacteria in her body, causing her infection. Even if only one of these million bacteria in her body carried the genes for resistance to the antibiotic, it would now have the extra space to reproduce and fill in the now empty niche from the 999,999 deaths from the non-resistant types. If Jane ends up needing antibiotics again, either for another case of bacterial pneumonia or for a different infection that also requires antibiotics for treatment, it can further solidify this resistant variation as the sole survivor. If Jane has to come back to the hospital again with another case of bacterial pneumonia, but this time with the infection with the strain that's resistant to amoxicillin, her care will likely be delayed as it will take the medical team some time to observe the resistance and to try out other additional antibiotics that may or may not be successful in treating her infection. 
Even if the medical team is able to find a different antibiotic that is successful in treating Jane's infection, there could be another resistant strain adapting and emerging into all of this now new open space from the removed infection and the other removed microbial diversity in her microbiome that is caught in the crossfire. Like Jane, recent studies have suggested that otherwise normal individuals have lost 15 to 40 percent of their microbial diversity. As Dr. Blazier points out in his book, the likely culprit would be antibiotic use, wiping out these microbes. This loss in microbial diversity is akin to seeing animal species going extinct around the world. Some of these microbes getting wiped out are ones that we probably haven't even discovered yet. Each year, at least 2.8 million people in the U.S. will get infections that are resistant to antibiotics. Over 35,000 of them will die from it. Worldwide, this kills at least 1.27 million people and was associated with nearly 5 million deaths in 2019 alone. Each course of antibiotics is associated with an 18% increased risk of developing Crohn's disease, which is a type of inflammatory bowel disease. People who develop celiac disease, which is a disease that causes the body to develop an immune reaction towards eating gluten, are 40% more likely to have had a course of antibiotics in the prior months compared to the control condition. The incidence rate of celiac disease is over four times greater than what it was in the 1950s. Animal studies in mice found that even low-dose antibiotics can result in weight gain and can permanently change development and metabolism. In these mice that were given low-dose antibiotics, they will absorb more fat from meals, put on more weight from the same amount of calories, and put on more body fat than the control condition did. That's also one of the main reasons why livestock are given antibiotics, to help fatten them up as quickly as possible. That's another concern of Dr. Blazier, which is the detectable levels of antibiotics in our food and drink products. All of this is just barely scratching the surface to the potential dark side of the antibiotic winter. One that can leave the world more susceptible to sickness and disease while also taking away the effectiveness from our primary method of treatment. Antibiotics have their use, but we have to account for the unintended consequences. The gut microbiome and all of the unique microbes within it are an incredibly complex system that we still have only an elementary understanding of. But more studies come out each week. Who knows what the dogma-changing discovery will be and when it will come.